All right. Uh, the last uh, talk for this session is Dove Gordon on secure computing with uh, low communication from cross-checking. Hi, thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, a protocol for secure computation. Um, so not much to do with PL, but uh, it is a very simple protocol, which I'm hoping everyone can understand by the end of the talk, uh, and very, very practical. So the aim here is pure efficiency, simple, and um, you know, easy to use. Um, so the model is restricted in, in the aims of achieving that goal. So in order to make this extremely cheap in terms of communication, computation, and, and just the simplicity of explaining it, we're going to make a, a, an assumption that um, we're always computing with four parties. I'll motivate that in a moment. Uh, and we always assume that at most one of them is malicious. So we allow fully malicious behavior by that one party, but everybody else is assumed to be honest. Okay, so these are, uh, you know, fairly strong assumptions, but I think well-motivated. And, and like I said, the trade-off is that we get a very, very simple protocol. Um, so um, let me talk about why that, why that is a reasonable assumption. Um, I think it's slightly motivated already by the previous talk, but we've been seeing a lot of, of protocols being used. I've actually, arguably, everybody who's tried to monetize secure computation so far has used uh, a three-party computation, where essentially you collect millions of inputs secret shared among three computational servers, and then those three servers do the computation on behalf of the users and have no stake in the computation other than that. In fact, they may not see any output at all, um, but essentially are just employed as hired guns to do the computation and to do it privately. Um, this is well-motivated, well, it might be obvious by now, although reviewers didn't seem to think so. But, uh, um, but I think, you know, uh, maybe the example I like most is, is the example of the Boston Women's Workforce Council. A lot of corporations were perfectly happy with the solution because it gave them, I hear from Mayank, it gave them the legal cover to argue that they never shared their data with anybody publicly and that was good enough. Whether it's three parties that they're secret sharing or two or four would be immaterial to them. Um, now it is a weakening over the, what we make here is a, the, uh, an assumption that only one out of four is malicious instead of one out of three. So there is definitely a weakening here of the security guarantee, but from someone's perspective, you know, a lawyer who, who is concerned about opening their data, they probably don't care about this very much. Uh, so what does it buy us, this, this weakening? Um, so the end result is that we can compute using six, you can think of it, well, so C here is the size of the circuit we're computing, F is the field we're computing over, uh, or it could be a ring. Um, and uh, kappa is the security parameter. So if you substitute in here uh, two for F, if you think about binary circuits, we're sending six bits per gate in this computation, which is extremely small compared to prior results. Um, and like I say here, we can, we can support arbitrary fields or rings, so we can compute over the integers if, if that's uh, more useful. Um, but uh, regardless, we're using six integers then per gate. Um, and just to give you a quick comparison, if you want to do this in the two-party setting with malicious security, uh, I think the best known results require 2,300 bits per gate. So we're talking about you know, several 2,000-fold, well, I guess not 2,000, whatever it is, 500-fold um, improvement or something. So uh, this is pretty appealing as compared to the two-party setting. Of course, the two-party setting, you don't have this honest majority assumption. right? So one out of four is the honest majority assumption. Two-party, the comparison's a little unfair. And in the three-party setting, we, we save by a factor of a little over three. So the best known prior work in the three-party setting with one corruption required 21 bits per gate, and now we can get it down to six. Um, but also in comparison to that, you're going to see how simple this protocol is, which I think is another selling point. I mean, I actually think I'm going to start using this protocol to teach secure computation to new PhD students because it abstracts out all the complications that, that we have to deal with when we move to three or two parties uh, and really just simplifies everything to the, you know, the, as basic as it can be. Well, you'll see you get the malicious for almost for free here. But yeah, okay, so that's a that's a fair point. It'll be the second protocol I teach to my students. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm actually just going to tell you exactly what the protocol is. Um, so I'll start easy, and we'll handle uh, addition gates or XOR gates if we're in the Boolean context. Um, so we're going to have what I call masked evaluations throughout this, this protocol, which is basically what most cryptographers are used to with only a very small adjustment to the way I present things, but it's really just in presentation. But we're going to think of this invariant that we have masked wire values throughout our computation. Okay, so M is the masked value, X is the actual value carried on the wire, and lambda is just a random mask 
which uh, if we're thinking in, in Boolean circuits, then lambda is just a random bit. And of course, neither party knows x or lambda, they just know the masked value. So the, the value of x is fully hidden from them. And what they want to do then is compute the masked wire for the output uh, wire of this gate. And in the addition case, it's very simple. We're just going to add a constraint that the lambda masks are correlated. So lambda c here is going to be lambda a plus lambda b. And they don't need to talk to each other. I just take my mask value, which is the same as your mask value. I'm not dealing with secret shares here. Okay, so we both know the masked value on A. We both know the masked value on B. We agree on what they are, although we don't have to, you know, we'll come back to the malicious setting in a moment and find out what happens when someone deviates. But for now, we both have the same masked value. And without talking, we just add them together. And now we have the masked value on the output wire. So additions are free, so to speak, which is what we're sort of used to as cryptographers. Um, and the only requirement then is that this, this mask is the sum of these two masks. So when I add these together, I get xA plus xB plus lambda A plus lambda B, which is I'm defining to be lambda C. Okay, so addition is, is really trivial and requires no communication. As is always the case in these protocols, multiplication is where, where the fun is. Um, so for cryptographers, you can ignore this because it's what you're used to seeing. And if you're not a cryptographer, you can ignore this and just trust me that it's right. But uh, basically, I mean, the point here is that Again, as long as we have some correlated information, so what we're going to have is secret shares now of these masked values, which we didn't need for addition. But now we're going to assume, and I'll have to come back to how we get these values. That's always the trick in these protocols, is how you generate this, uh, this material that you need to, to actually compute the circuit. But for now, let's just assume that we were given secret shares of these values. And then it's just a simple computation, which again is completely local up till the very last step where we have to open a secret sharing of the masked output. But I mean, so basically here, I'm just multiplying two constants, right? These are masks. We can both do that locally. We share the same, we both know the, these constants. Here, you're multiplying a constant by a secret share. That can also be just be done locally. I multiply by mine, you multiply by yours. And then adding this, which is now a constant, to this, which is a secret share, one of us adds and the other one doesn't, and now we have a secret sharing of, of that value. And you can just work the algebra out on your own and trust me that what you end up with is a secret share of the masked output, the multiplication of, of the two input wires. And then uh, I want this invariant that what we don't, we, I don't want to deal with secret shares. In our protocol, it's much easier to think about masked values. So we'll just open the secret share, and that's our only communication so far. Okay, so throughout, I want to count how much we have to communicate. So we have to send one value here for every gate, which is just to open the secret sharing. If you're used to seeing beaver triples as a cryptographer, this is exactly the same thing. I just we're doing the opening um, as part of the computation, at the end of the computation instead of at the beginning of the computation. So I'm presenting it as an opening of the output wire rather than an opening of a masked input wire. Usually you just, you know, you start the cycle at a different point, but it's the same exact thing. So there's a reason I want to talk about these masked values instead of secret shares. Um, so in all of these computations, I mean, this, this is exactly what's been known for 30 years. There's nothing new here. In all of these computations, the problem you deal with when you get to the malicious setting is that one of these guys could manipulate the share of the output wire of this gate by just changing, you know, so they, were, they both computed their share of this and then they're supposed to exchange them so they can open up the masked output value. One of them can just change that arbitrarily. So they can change the value on any wire anytime that they'd like to just by lying about what their share was. And that's what we're gonna have to deal with uh, when we move to, you know, handling malicious behavior. Um, and, uh, okay, so before I come to that, let me talk about how we get all these values we need, right? So we need secret shares of these masks in order to compute these multiplication gates. In, in general, secure computation, when you allow arbitrary number of parties and an arbitrary number of corruptions, this is where the cost is. Everything else looks exactly like what I just described, but generating this material is extremely costly. And the nice thing about this assumption that we only have one corruption and exactly four parties is that it becomes really, really simple. Basically, we're going we're gonna to have each pair generate masks for the other pair. Later, we're going to compute this thing twice, and we're going to make sure that they're consistent with each other to catch any cheating in the online phase. But for the moment, let's think about one execution. So for, for this pair to execute, they need material. They're going to get it from this pair. And we'll ask this pair to just generate two identical copies. And because only one of them is malicious, if anything is detected to be inconsistent, then these guys can just give up and abort right away. So they just get two copies from the other pair that should be identical. They, share, they start by sharing some seed to a PRG. 
Um, they generate identical material for the other two parties. And then one of them can even just hash their, their uh, set. They don't have to send the full data. So what you end up sending here is, uh, hopefully I put it on the slide. No, I didn't put it on the slide, but okay, here's the, the communication cost. It's 2C plus some, some number of, of hashes, which we can just call O of kappa. So, um, so yeah, it's two because in this case, one of these two parties has to send the full set of masks. The other one just sends a hash. Then we're actually gonna have to do the same in the other direction, which doubles the cost. So that gets us to our full 6C of communication. And now I just have to tell you how we handle uh, corruption in the online phase. Are there any questions up till here? Um, okay, so, um, all right, so they, they abort if it's not identical. They send back in the other direction. So now let me tell you what, why we need these two copies. So, so remember that in the online phase, yeah. Yes. So it looks like there's, uh, there's four pieces of information per gate, not just two like you wrote. Uh, because there's a whole, there's a triple, there's A, B, C. So, well, for each, sorry. Um, uh, Maybe it's one, one piece of information per wire and then. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember my accounting because I haven't okay. actually run through the math in a little while. Okay, some of them can be random maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yes, exactly, right. I don't care that lambda A and lambda B have any structure. They can be generated from a seed, and then you know, it's only the correlation that I actually have to send. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for answering your own question. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, okay so, so now in the online phase, I have to worry that somebody didn't actually open their share honestly, and they maybe manipulated something, and so now we have to add in some sort of a check to make sure that that, that didn't happen. And that's why we're gonna run this protocol twice in parallel so that we can cross check with each other to see that nobody cheated. So um, for that purpose, I'm gonna define something called a, a double mask, a doubly masked value. So remembering that we have two independent instances here, but the wire value should be the same everywhere. So in both executions, X, W should be the same. Uh, I, one pair knows the mask that the other set was using, and that pair knows the mask that the first set was using. We can't expose the wire value to each other. Nobody should see that. But what we can do is we can, I can add the mask you guys were using and you can add the masks that we were using and then again, we should have exactly the same value. So what we do is we compare these doubly masked values uh, with each other wire by wire. And, um, and then it's just a question of handling some subtleties. So let me just point out that if you do this naively, there actually is an attack. And in fact, this is, same idea has been employed in the two party setting to get very cheap secure computation. And there, there's actually, an unavoidable, well, I don't know if it's truly unavoidable, but there's a bit of leakage that nobody has really figured out how to erase yet. Uh, here, we don't have any leakage, and that's because the four-party uh, assumption gives us, this one out of four corruption model gives us a way of bypassing it, but I'll, I'll show you what this attack would look like if you weren't being careful about that. Um, so suppose that, um, uh, so we're supposed to compare these values. If we compare them and they're the same, then everything is great, well, we hope, right? Uh, but now imagine this attack. So these two guys are computing one instance of the circuit together, and these two guys are computing an instance of the circuit together. And when they opened the, the masked value on wire W, uh, this guy cheated and, and changed his share. And you can think of it as effectively he used a different mask than he was supposed to. Um, and now, of course, in, when they go and compare with each other to see that, that uh, the doubly masked values are the same, it'll be detected and, and this guy will say, these guys will both decide that they should abort. Okay, so immediately this is detected. However, if that message doesn't get back up to here, this guy who was malicious can always correct his doubly masked value at the time that they go and compare. He doesn't have to use the same value he sent to him during the evaluation uh, to this guy when he does this comparison to check, you know, to cross check the evaluations. So he corrects his mistake and this guy is happy and is willing to continue. And if it wasn't communicated to him that that was a problem, then, sorry, let me stick with this slide for a second. If it's not communicated, then the next wire might leak information that we weren't supposed to leak. So if this guy doesn't get the message that he should stop, and this is sort of what happens in the two-party setting, there's nobody here to stop the second party if, if we try to use a similar technique in the two-party setting. But um, then what ends up happening is that the next wire 
ends up being dependent on the wire that here was, was messed up and it leaks information. I'll show you concretely what I mean. So let's suppose they were computing an AND gate. And so this guy flips the value of the input wire. Right? Even without knowing what it is, he flips it by adding a 1. Okay, so we're in a Boolean setting here. If it was 0, it's a 1. If it's a 1, it's a 0. And so that gets detected here when they do their cross-checking, which is great. But now if he corrects the value when he does a cross-checking up here, it may be that the output mask value is exactly correct because it's an AND gate. If this was a zero, then flipping this value didn't matter, right? And so now the, the output of the AND gate is, is also going to be uh, correct. He knows what it is, and he can continue with the cross-checking with this guy without, um, without you know, causing him to abort. So what he learns when he sees that, uh, that the output mask in this execution ends up being consistent even at the next wire is that this input wire here, this input bit must have been a zero rather than a one. So this is actually very easy to fix. We just have to make sure that nobody continues after anyone has detected an abort. And that would be great if we weren't worried about the cost of, communi you know, of communicating this cross check because um, I've already used up my budget. I promised six bits per gate, and now I don't want to actually communicate for this cross-checking at every single wire. But if we were willing to just check in with each other after each and every cross-check, then, then this attack would be taken care of. We wouldn't have any problem, and we'd be finished in terms of security. So now we just need to sort of optimize this checking so that we avoid these sort of pitfalls where you accidentally leak information but still um, catch adversarial behavior and don't waste any more communication. So it's, it's not that hard. Um, basically, you know, the, the first stab at this is that we're just going to wait till we're completely done before doing any cross-checking. We're going to hash all of our doubly masked values, and then we're going to do a secure, another secure computation that checks that the hash values all match, that H1 and H3, those two top guys, have the same hash of all the doubly masked values, and H3 and H4 have the same hash of all the doubly masked values. We should do all the checks at once. And if there's an inconsistency anywhere, we don't leak which wire it was. We don't leak whether there was another inconsistency downstream. So we don't leak any information at all. The only thing that's sort of unappealing about this, I mean, it actually gives me the asymptotic claims that I made in the beginning, because this is independent of the circuit, right? This is just an equality check on two hash values, or whatever it is, an and of two equality checks on hash values. Uh, but we would have to come up with a new four-party protocol for doing that. And we didn't really want to have to rely on other existing protocols. So we, we did a little bit better in this cross-check um, to make it all self-contained and, and sort of simple conceptually. Uh, and so basically, here's our, our way of doing this cross-checking after doing the entire evaluation. These two guys, so, so remember what we want is that if these guys, uh, let me say it again, if he messes up a wire, what he knows for sure is that it will be detected down here. What he doesn't know is whether it would influence things downstream for this guy. So what we want then is basically that uh, these guys will perform the check on their mask values, and these guys will perform the check on their mask values. And then nothing leaks to the adversary, because he always knew that these guys would detect any deviation. So all he finds out through this process is that these guys detected some deviation because they're the ones checking their masked values. So we sort of restore the this, this same property we had when we go wire by wire in our cross-checking, but we can do it all after the fact without uh, hurting security, and then we can use hashes of the, of the masked values instead of having to send a value for each gate. So I mean, I'm just you know sort of skimping on one bit here and one bit there, but this gets us from, say, 8 bits per gate to 6 bits per gate or something like that. Um, so the way this is done is just at the end, they agree on a nonce, they hash their doubly masked values and send those hashes um, to these guys who will then, based on whether they see any inconsistency, determine a fixed bit that we call a veto. So if he sees that there's any inconsistency in their evaluations, he's going to veto, which is an indication that he wants to abort. He does the same, he does the same, he does the same, and now all we need to do is compute three OR gates of these four veto bits. And now we can use our own protocol for that and go wire by wire like I showed you in the earlier slides. Because for three gates, who cares if we have to send these, these cross-check values at every single gate? Um, so now this becomes extremely cheap. It's a three-gate circuit, and we just do it without any of this extra, you know, yeah. No. Uh, 
So yes, we only want to reveal the or, and that's right, because what he, does, what he knows is that someone over here would veto him. Actually, both of these guys would veto him. Uh, what we, um, I think if, if you reveal the values of all these bits that the, the attack from before comes back, but I have to think through why again, yeah. Um, okay, so the communication of this thing is about 10 kappa. Uh, it's the number of hash, hashes we have to send around, but this is for the entire circuit. So we don't need to, you know, there's no multiplicative factor here of C. And how much time do I have? I think I'm gonna finish early actually. So, okay, so the only other result in the paper is, okay, great, so you all get an extra break. Um, the only other results worth mentioning in the paper is that we add robustness if that's a desired property. So uh, we can guarantee output delivery even if somebody aborts or cheats or whatever. Uh, and we have to do a little bit of work to figure that out, but it's actually not that much. Um, so we need a, a broadcast channel, but with four parties, you know, that's a constant effort there. Um, we need uh, some kind of committing encryption and signatures. Um, and then you can basically figure out from the broadcast and the signatures, you can see who it was that sent inconsistent values. Um, so you can kind of, everyone can know who to blame. The only case where that's not true is a sort of interesting case where P1 sends nothing to P3. P3 can't prove that that's true about P1. How do we know that's not P3 who's lying? But in that interesting case, you can just ignore P1. So he goes, he takes the secret to the grave with him. He knows P1 is the bad guy, but he just uses P2's material for his computation and, and nobody ever knows, but nobody ever cares. Um, so you kind of figure out that corner case, but otherwise not much uh, challenge to making it robust, which is kind of nice. Um, and also not much extra cost, except for this, in this pre-processing, we had to use these committed encryptions and, and some signatures. Um, Oh, uh, the other thing is that at the time of the cross-checking, so we have to be able to know who to blame again, and you sort of, you kind of just weasel it down to three possible cases. So if P3 complains, it could be that P1 and P2 had a bad evaluation. It could be that um, P3 and P, uh, the mask, sorry, it could be P1 and P2 have a bad evaluation. It could be P3 and P4 have a bad evaluation. Or it could be that, um, that either, uh, P1 modified his masked evaluation for the cross-checking or that P3 is lying. So you can kind of put those into three different cases and do a secure computation at each gate when you do your cross-checking. If you detect that there's a problem, you do a secure computation where they input their state and uh, determine which of these three cases it is. And within the case, you don't ever learn whether it was P1 or P2, but you again don't care. As long as you know that one of those guys is bad, these guys can finish their evaluation. And if you know that these guys are bad, those guys can finish their evaluation. And if you know that it's one of these guys that are bad, then these guys do the cross-checking and, and you're done. Um, uh, and that's, yeah, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take questions. We, um, oh, I, I should say we, we've, in a follow-up work on some other stuff I've done, we've been using this for a large-scale computation. And uh, I, mean, it, it, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves, but we can, um, we can do like 50 million we can compute over 50 complicated gradient descent and machine learning algorithms on 50 million uh, records in like seven minutes over a wide area network. So I mean, it, it really does take you to a scale that I think is, is finally usable in the right context. And of course, you just have to be willing to accept the, the weak security notion, but I think it's very reasonable in a lot of cases. If you got for primitives, is it just secure channels? Uh, it's basically just the PRG. I mean, you know, the, for the accounting and the communication, we need to be able to shrink things in hashes and PRGs. That's it, yeah. You know, we could do an information theoretic variant with more communication. But it's just beaver triples where you trust, you, you check the correctness of them by looking at consistency. That's all it is. Six bits plus you know, maybe 10 kappa or 20 kappa. Like broadcast six bits, like pairwise six bits, what do you mean by six bits? One and a half bits per party per gate is the total number that they have to send. So it's, it's you know, slightly imbalanced in the sense that you have to send one and a half per gate in the pre-processing and then, it, or sorry, you send a half a bit per gate in the pre-processing and that's because one party sends all the masks and the other sends a hash, but you could always divide that in half if you want. So you send a half a bit per person 
per gate in the preprocessing, and then another bit when you open your share uh, during the evaluation. It's a pairwise channel. I mean, if you want robustness, then it has to be over a broadcast channel. But it, so n here is four, always. So it means four. <laughs> so the six was not about the robust protocol. Yeah, it'll, it'll be greater for the robust protocol. Yeah, so if you're willing to just accept aborts, then, then it's six. And if you're not, then you have to add a broadcast, and that becomes a little more expensive. Uh, are those doubly shared values also generated by PRGs? or? So uh, some of them can be generated by a PRG, because some of them are just independent random values. And then there's some that, are, that have these correlations. So the output wire on every multiplication gate has to be correlated with the input ones. So there you, you can't compress. But that's why we get it down only to one per wire instead of zero, or per gate, I mean. Uh, 